Hello, I'm Damien Barr, and you're listening to the podcast of my live literary salon, where I tempt the world's finest writers to read from their latest, greatest works and share their own stories. Every salon is special, but this one is super duper extra special for me because I'm doing it with the wondrous Armistead Maupin, one of my lifelong heroes. When I found Tales of the City, when he took me to 28 Barbary Lane, I honestly think he saved my life, and maybe he saved yours too. So here's me and Armistead Maupin launching his memoir at the glamorous Theatre Royal in Brighton. Good evening, Brighton! Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, and those clever enough to have transcended gender. Welcome to the gorgeous Theatre Royal for a very special salon. Um, Hands up if this is your first salon that hasn't involved a waxing. (laughs) Oh, you've all been before. There's a lady back there brave enough to admit it. Quite hairy. I'll let that sink in. Um, So anyway, tonight tonight is our ninth birthday, and over the past almost decade... We've welcomed a heady mix of writers, including Jojo Moyes, David Nichols, Diana Athol, and John Waters, who told me, if you go home with somebody and they don't have books, don't fuck them. <laughs> Not going to be a problem for anybody here tonight. It's going to be all, oh, I've read Tales of the City too. <laughs> it's like Grinder Live. The nearest gay that can read is two rows away. And who knew there were 750 gays that could read? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Waters also warned me to be careful on my book tour. He said that if somebody asks you to sign their colostomy bag, be sure to use a felt tip. <laughs> That's really very true. Um, I see some lovely past salon guests here tonight. Obviously, we've got Patrick Gale in the Princess Margaret Memorial Box. And we have here in the front row S.J. Watson, ladies and gentlemen. We have Tracy Thorne and Juno Dawson in the house. We have toured the world with our literary salon, Sydney, New York, Berlin, and, of course, San Francisco. Our current London home is the Savoy, but it's brilliant to be here in Brighton tonight to do this really special ninth birthday on the stage that has been graced by Gielgud, Dietrich and Divine, by St. Joan of Collins, the wigs of St. Joan of Collins, (laughs) and the slightly uncomfortable political opinions of St. Joan of Collins. (laughs) And, of course, various residual Nolans. I've actually got the ashes of Marty Kane at the side of the stage. Oh, she's lovely. Tonight, some of you have come all the way from Hove. A shout out from Hove. And from as far afield as Port Salad de Mer, which is how I understand you pronounce it. I myself have come all the way um, down Dyke Road. Really, a bit of a stretch. We've got a whole row in from 28 Barbary Lane, the boutique in Kemp Town. Can we have a shout out here? Oh, they're there. Oh, oh, she's wearing the merchandise. Very good on brand. We've got a wee couple in from Scotland. Where are you? Shout. Couple from Scotland. Have you not caught the train? Oh, they've not made it yet. We'll do them at the second half. And we've got various birthdays and anniversaries. So welcome all to the Independent People's Republic of Brighton and Hove. Uh, Brighton has always attracted outsiders and more than its fair share of admiration and envy. Here we are in Pride and Prejudice, no less. Jane Austen says, they must all go to Brighton. That is the place to get husbands. (laughs) Indeed it is. Whoever you are, we've always had a good reputation for being bad. Dear Noel Coward, my patron saint and spirit animal, said... Ah, dear Brighton, peers, queers and racketeers. But the last word on our fair city must go to Samuel Rogers, 19th century poet and salon host, who said, Brighton is still very gay and full of balls. (laughs) So it's wonderful to be celebrating our ninth birthday here in the city that I chose as home, or did it choose me? Tonight is a dream come true. The right book in the right hands at the right time can change a life maybe even save it. That's what Tales of the City did for me, and I suspect more than a few of you too. Michael Mouse has Mona and Mary Ann and Mrs. Magical, and he has sex with men up the bum and doesn't go to hell. (laughs) 
He even appears to have fun and make friends while doing it. It was, shall we say, inspiring. I was 14 and busy hating my big gay self when I won a school trip from an especially unsunny corner of Scotland down to Brighton. That trip changed my life. I wrote about my first glimpse of the San Francisco of the South and of tales in my memoir, Maggie and Me, and I'm just going to read a tiny bit for you now. Up ahead, Brighton Pier flashes out of the night, plunging straight out to sea. It is a long finger dripping with diamond rings beckoning us in. A brightly lit merry-go-round spins. Our taxi driver doesn't notice anything and stops at a red light. Not one of his passengers has eyes for the road. As the light turns amber, I spot a nightclub called Revenge. (laughs) The queue to get in is all young guys and some of them are holding hands. They're not scared looking or even acting ashamed. I worry for them. Amber goes to green and I stare at them through the rear window as we jerk forwards. I feel myself blushing and blinking. Now, we didn't win the school quiz. It was very sad, but we did get £25 of Virgin Megastore vouchers. And there was a Virgin Megastore in Brighton. Um, And I went there. So we sniggered at the name. Heather, my girlfriend, that's how long ago this is, (laughs) is studying the cassette singles when I point to the videos. My mum doesn't like me watching Channel 4 after that time she turned on My Beautiful Laundrette. And we both had to sit there because if one of us turned it over, it meant acknowledging something. (laughs) Awkward. I sneak bits late at night with the volume right down and I watch all of Lost Language of the Cranes in near silence. Virgin has a section with a big G-A-Y sign, but I can't go there. I rush straight past to the books. Heather knows what I'm after and finds them first. I hover, afraid to place a hand on the glaring cover. Go on, she says. I pick it up and nothing happens. I grab the next one and the one after that until I've got them all. We tried to get them out of the library, but it didn't stalk them. They wouldn't stalk them. Heather pushes me towards the cashier, a girl, thank God. I blush as I hand her the vouchers. What did you get? Someone asked me later. I my bag. Oh, it's a present for me, lies Heather. And I take her hand and we smile at each other and can't wait to read the tales of the city. You can applaud. <laughs> From the conservative South to liberal San Francisco via Vietnam, from his palm-reading granny to an awkward chat about girls with President Nixon to Rock Hudson, who was huge in so many ways. (laughs) The man from Barbary Lane is here tonight to celebrate the launch of his long-awaited memoir, Logical Family. Please welcome Armistead Maupin! Now that's a bright and welcome, and a mm-hmm. whole welcome, I should add. Um, so this is your first trip here in how long? We were trying to work I it out I think it's earlier. been 16 or 17 years. Oh my God. Um, it was for the night listener the last time I was here. I think it's been that long. And there are still people on the nudist beach who were there at that time. <laughs> they actually haven't gone indoors. Um, <laughs> now, we talked about this earlier. You said you would read a little bit for us, which is a special treat, and I'm sure people want to hear you read. So, uh, And I'm happy to read the, the bit you... Ch- the, the dirty bit. The dirty bit that you chose. <laughs> Come on. It's what you're here for. Okay. Don't worry. <laughs> I wasn't at uh, at a loss for how to spend my nights. I could amble down Russian Hill to the hubbub of North Beach, sometimes taking a longer, more scenic route through the leafy canyon of McCondry Lane, just so I could descend the rickety wooden stairway leading down to Taylor Street. There were several such pedestrian byways hidden in the crevices of Russian Hill, but this was the one that inspired the Barbary Lane in my books. I was deliberate in the juxtaposition of those words, Barbary to connote the raw-boned frontier wildness of the city, Lane to suggest the peace of an English village. Seemingly contradictory, yet anyone could sample both sensations in the course of a 20-minute stroll down to North Beach. Once you hit Columbus and past the bustling Italian cafes, you had only to take a left at Carol Dota's blinking nipples on the sign in front of Big Al's. <laughs> 
The last few blocks were the hardest since aggressive barkers and sometimes the girls themselves would try to drag you into the clubs for what was known then as a nude encounter. I would pick up my pace here with a smile plastered on my face. My own nude encounters awaited me at the foot of Broadway where a faceless, signless, four-story concrete building stood beneath a freeway off-ramp that has long since been torn down. The building is still there, considerably altered. A quick online search reveals that the bones of its high sailing to front room can still be glimpsed in the shared office space it offers millennials with laptops and dreams of a startup. This was Dave's baths. Even those two words suggest an unlikely duality. The term baths conjures up a bacchanal in Roman times. Add the word Dave's to the front, and (laughs) voila, you have a folksy barbershop in Toledo. (laughs) Both masculine moods were invoked, each in its own uh, nourishing way once you got inside. You had to sign up at the desk. I'm assuming that most guys gave a fake name. I certainly did, since they never checked IDs, and I was still worrying about whether or not this was actually legal. I used the name L.O.B. Branch. Grandly enough, though it may help to know that it was a jokey spin on my Confederate ancestor's name, Lawrence O'Brien Branch. L-O-B Branch. Okay, right, makes it even worse. (laughs) The hardest thing about confronting your past is the pinch of the overlapping parts, when you are no longer one thing and not quite the other. It makes you squirm to face yourself in transition, foolish and floundering, But it has to be said that if anything delivered me from the privileged white elitism of my youth, it was the red-lit cubicles and darkened hallways and even darker mazes of Dave's baths. Everyone went there, pilgrims united and on a quest for cock, and even a rejection, if delivered kindly enough, could reveal the difference between a bastard and a nice guy in the dark. My tastes in those days were largely vanilla and oral, It was still such a novelty to have one of those wonders in my mouth. (laughs) And only afterward, when I lay spent and happy in the arms of a stranger, another tender man-child like me, did it even begin to notice, did I even begin to notice the secondary matters of race, creed, and national origin. It was a deeply democratizing place. Sometimes I was democratized till dawn. Thank you for just proving something. That last line isn't in the, is, book. Isn't in the book. My editor, <laughs> my editor said, that's too much for the book. She said, some things work on the stage that don't work on the page. There's the paperback. Yeah, yeah. I'll get you're, it back You're going to shove that in the paperback, I can tell. <laughs> the, uh, the, she was worried because I tested a lot of this material out on drunk bears in Provincetown. <laughs> and... Uh, they tend to be a very forgiving audience. <laughs> um, so that was you in San Francisco. Let's, let's go right back to the very beginning. Before we get to the logical family, I think we need to talk a bit about the, logical, the biological family. Mm. So what did it mean to be born a Maupin and an Armistead Maupin? What was it like growing up in Raleigh in the 1950s and 60s? Uh, well, I w- it was... Uh... <laughs> I wrote a whole fucking book about it, Jamie. Uh, it w- I mean, we could just put the audio book on. Yeah. We could, yeah we, should we put the audio book on yeah. and we can go to Brighton Sauna and be democratized until dawn? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I could, I've that never would be been a plan. Actually. No, that's a good I question. Um, but, it mean, was a very conservative household. Yeah. My Just father was everything you can name, racist, misogynist, uh, certainly homophobic. He referred to our minister, who um, did sachet a bit, uh, <laughs> as a very nice fellow. Subtle. Um, and, and at the same time, when that minister had the courage to suggest that African Americans could uh, have received communion at the rail, which they had not ever in the history of the church, 
That's so hard to believe when you sit there and say, I mean, that's, that's the culture that you were growing that's up in. That's the culture. There was, a, there was a gallery, there was a balcony that had been the slave gallery. And in the 1950s, black folks could sit there if, like, you know, they were the maid in a household where a white girl was getting married. So uh, Reverend Dan Sapp, uh, who, was, uh, who uh, was really a campy thing most of the time, um, he used to love telling new parishioners that he, they should come to his office and see his collection of cocks. Um, that's like a scandal in the Church of England. There, there, she's with that right now. There, there was a weathercock on the oh, steeple okay. of Christ Church. It was a rarity. It didn't have a cross up there. It had a rooster. And so he had all these cocks, and he loved shocking people in that way. <laughs> and if he was dressed in ras- raspberry, as Episcopal clerics sometimes are, uh, he would co- refer to his dress. So there was this there was duality, uh, yeah. you know. Th- there were little hints coming through all the time that there was a world out there that was not really the one that um, my father was approving of. But he, the, the reverend that you talk about in the raspberry, he was one of the first people in your community to kind of show you, a, I mean, a different way of being different. He decided that he wanted to desegregate the church. Yes, he that did. Your, that your family had worshipped in for a very long time. Yeah. In Pew 17, we owned Pew 17. We, didn't, we hadn't bought it, but it was where we were supposed to be. Yeah. And one day, some family came in. One day when we weren't there, which was frequently, we often weren't in church on Sunday, a family came in, and uh, the two old ladies, Miss, Miss Nell and Miss Elizabeth Hensdale, who sat in front of us, both wearing an entire dead animal of some sort, <laughs> with the snout and the paws and the tail... <laughs> They told my parents that this house painter had taken over our pew. So that became the thing that spurred us on on Sunday morning, my father saying, come on, Diana, that goddamn house painter is going to take over the pew again. <laughs> so um, on the day that, uh, that Dan Sapp um, preached that we should be segre- desegregating the church, my father said, come on, and he got us all to stand up and walk out of the church. I think he thought that he was going to be the beginning of a, a mighty righteous um, parade of protesters who were leaving the church, but it was just us. And I remember looking back uh, at the at Reverend Sapp up in the pulpit, sort of standing there like this with his hand on his hip and a very smart, you know, weird, weird little smile on his face as we did it. He liked my father. He, yeah. he teased my father, he, but he tried to be the conscience in his presence. So how did you feel at that moment when your dad marched you out of the church and nobody else followed? Humiliated, completely humiliated. Uh, Are my pants ringing or are yours? (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I remember thinking, I remember feeling sorry for him. We got home and he said something about, uh, uh, he was talking about the dam down in our garden, which he had worked on. It was always breaking. It It was always leaking after a storm. And he'd say, oh, the dam's leaking again. We've got to do something about it, son. And that was how we bonded. I would go with him um, and help him get planks. He was actually tearing planks out of the basement of the house to shore up this dam. He was sort of cannibalizing the house to keep this, this engineering project going. I feel sure there's a metaphor in there somewhere. There is. Um, and so, so, so this, was, this was happening, um, and you felt, you felt embarrassed, you felt sad for, for, for your dad, and, and that's because at that time, really, those, those were the values that you were being subjected to. They were being broadcast to you the, the whole time. And really, you were super conservative then. I was. I, I, I took it with me to college. And I had learned when I was 15 years old from a friend of mine, because uh, it had never been mentioned in the family, that my father's father had uh, committed suicide in the family home uh, when... Most of the family, excepting my father, were there. He had, he had blown his head off with a shotgun. And, and you uh, were 15 when you I was 15 when I found out. And my father was always making noises about, well, you won't have me around much longer. And I took that to mean that uh, suicide ran in the family <laughs> and he was going to do something. And every time he got angry and stormed off to the room, uh, to his bedroom, I could imagine that he was getting the, 
had a captured Japanese pistol in his desk, and, and I thought he was going to kill himself. So as a, as, a, as a child and as a young person, particularly as a teenager, that's a, that's a message to you to, to not rock the boat, to be completely Com perfect. Completely, yeah. yeah. Uh, I wanted to make him proud of me, so I did everything. I, you know, I ended up being uh, unofficial uh, city manager of Raleigh at some point, and I made a speech to the local newspaper about how we conservatives are going to take over the world one day and put well, an end to all, true, unfortunately. all this social... <laughs> I was right, yeah. Um, and I, uh, I went to work... Uh, you went to work for Jesse Helms? I went to work for Jesse Helms. I mean, I'm not sure if people know exactly who he is. Somebody here, does, because they're leaking the tire over there. there. Yeah, somebody's testing it. But I mean, so, yeah. you know, he's... Describe who he is as a He figure. was, for many years, the most homophobic senator uh, in the U.S. Senate. Uh, when I m got the job from him, he was executive vice president of a, of a TV station. And he... Um, had this five-minute editorial every night that riled up the base, you know, about the th things that bothers the base today, even. He talked about the University of North Carolina, UNC, standing for um, the University of Negroes and Communists. On the air, on a, on a local TV station in Raleigh. And uh, when I flunked out of law school at Chapel Hill, because I was not attending classes... Yeah. Uh, I needed work before I went into the Navy, and my father said, Jesse will get you a job. So I went to work uh, at the TV station, and, uh, and uh, Jesse sat me down. Jesse was very proud of me because I'd been writing these columns in the, in the, in the newspaper, in the, the, university. the university newspaper. And he said, she told me that uh, in no uncertain terms that I was the hope of the future which is pretty much the only fucking thing he was ever right about. <laughs> uh, and, uh, yeah. And so, yeah, I worked for him. It, it was another person like Richard Nixon who came into my life at yeah, one point. Yeah, we'll talk about Nixon in a bit. Where it was so hard to heroicize him. I don't know if you've seen pictures of Jesse Helms, but... I don't actually know what he looks like. He, he had all these big spectacles, and he had... <laughs> Sort of a twisted little mouth, and was, he was not an attractive man. And the saliva would form in one corner into a little pearl that I tried not to look at <laughs> while he was talking to me. That's described in here, and I was reading it in Raleigh yeah. to about 250 people. Oh, you people. did not? That's brave. Uh, yeah, my hometown. My brother, amazingly, uh, sat in the back of the, you know, in the back of the room. Your brother, who is a Trump voter? My brother, the Trump supporter. Yeah. Sat there with his wife. I'm, I mean, I'm just relieved that he can't read because... Uh, <laughs> oh. And he's my little brother. I shouldn't be getting that kind of revenge, but I am right now. I've had it with that. That shit. Um, um, so, so your, your, your dad was um, a lawyer. He was very conservative. He was racist. He was homophobic. He was all the bad things. Um, and what was your, what was your mum like? Um, my mother yeah. um, was a very gentle creature. That who, her mother had, had, was English. Yeah. Um, uh, she, um, she had a, a, a radio show that gave advice to teens, which was ridiculous because... She, she really knew nothing about teenagers, even then. Um, and she wrote letters all the time. She, the first letter, the first thing I ever wrote uh, was a letter to a little girl. I was six, maybe, and I was really distressed about this little girl that had fallen down a well in California. Uh, it was the first widely publicized catastrophe ever shown on television. Uh, because they could get the cameras out there, and it was she fell through a hole about this big, and it was a thousand feet deep, and um, uh, and maybe not a thousand. That sounds I'm making that up. But <laughs> but it was a long way down, and I was upset, and my mother <laughs> wanted to comfort me, and so uh, she let me dictate a letter to the little girl. So and the idea was that it would just be dropped. Yeah. 
That was exactly. I, thought, I was picturing the whole thing. Oh, here comes my letter. <laughs> oh, there's hope. There's no letter for I can't read it as dog. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. And that was the first thing you. And your and mother was, helped you write. My that, mother she helped says a lot me about write it. And and I googled it recently and found out the name of the little girl and everything. Little Kathy Fiscus. Uh, and the, the whole story is there, and the, the huge number of people that were gathered around this hole when they sent the word that she had died. They said a um, uh, few hours after the last time her voice was heard, which is such a haunting yeah. detail. Yeah. And I don't think I ever heard that detail because my mother was busy distracting me yeah. uh, by taking me to antique stores. <laughs> I did that. I liked antiquing at a really early age. <laughs> you, say that, you say that in the book, and I'm thinking, like, what did your parents think when, they were, when you were eight and you were like, I want to go and find some mid-century modern furniture? Oh, you know, well, and, I wouldn't have been allowed to I do that. Been, yeah, you have been Victorian. That would have been very suspicious. My friend Eddie Russell, when he was 14, and, and uh, my, my mother said, he, Eddie's very sissy. You shouldn't spend so much time with him because people might get the wrong idea. And all I thought about him was that he liked movies as much as I did. Uh, and he did have Danish modern furniture in his house. <laughs> and that was practically communist in those days. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, so, yeah. your mother, so your mother indulged these kind of early, early passions. She wasn't in any way a, a constricting influence? No, not, was... not really. Um, I decided when I was 14 that I wanted a stained glass window in my bedroom. Which is <laughs> perfectly normal. Perfectly and normal and thing. Celebrate the stained glass window. There was a restaurant up in Virginia that we would pass that was sort of ye olde European thing that had stained glass windows, and I thought it was the most wonderful thing I'd ever seen. So my poor father had to take me out to some little workshop in the country where an old man made uh, windows for Baptist churches. And, uh, and I got to design the colors I wanted and the shapes of them and all of that. So they were, they saw it coming for a long, long time. <laughs> my grandmother, my English grandmother, yeah. who really was the biggest influence in my life, or the best one. She was kind of the first member of your logical family, wasn't she? Was. She was. Yeah. She was. She accepted me the way I was. And, she, and so she took me to see Singing in the Rain six times. <laughs> So I could learn all the words to, he held me in his arms, would you, would you? And not a good song to sing to your father. Um, uh, but uh, Granny, uh, who didn't live in Raleigh but came to visit periodically in her little beige Ford, um, told me that I was the reincarnation. She was certain that I was the reincarnation of her cousin Curtis, her bachelor cousin Curtis, <laughs> her extremely artistic bachelor. <laughs> and uh, she would read my poems on a regular basis. She grew up in, she was born in Derby, and she, she at that time, it was all that mysticism was going on, the, you know, the numerology and seances and fairies and and the kind of post-First World War seances, right. you know, we're going to contact right. the boys we lost yeah. in Europe. Yeah. And she was a suffragist um, uh, herself. I mean, she traveled to England making speeches. When I'm, when I'm in places like this, I think about her and wonder if she was... She spoke in York Cathedral at one point, uh, asking for rights for women. I often wonder, you know, if, our, if her ghostly path has crossed mine at some point. Um, but she took, when I was 14, um, I was walking with her through a, a garden party in Raleigh at a place called Mount Vernon because it was like a slightly smaller version of George Washington's house. <laughs> and uh, there was a woman ahead of us on the lawn who was um, just the ultimate femme creation. She was all pink and powdered and perfumed and she, she looked, as I said in the book, like a tipsy flamingo, <laughs> just, you know, making her way across the lawn. And my grandmother looked at me with a sly little smile on her face and said, um, any woman who is all woman 
or any man who is all man is a complete monster unfit for human company. <laughs> Very radical thing to hear. And you were how old? I was 14, and it was 1958 in the South. Amazing. Nobody said things like that. That's incredible. And so um, they waved you off to college. You went off to a very conservative college with the intention of doing... Well, no, it's a big old liberal college. Oh, it was? Okay. I was the campus conservative. Ah. <laughs> the star, then, even. Um, and so you I was, the... actually. I yeah. was a ham then, even, too. I knew I could get attention for being a conservative. Okay, like, kind of like, no, I was going to say Boris Johnson, but no. Um, no. Not that bad. And don't um, say Janos, whatever his no, no, name no, no, is. No, 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 that, not that. No, no, no not uh, him. What became of him? Is he dead? No. <laughs> That's next week. Um, yeah. So you were on campus. His being pearls a, strangled him, I guess. I, I, I hope so. Um, so you were on campus being the campus conservative. And how did, how did people treat you? Because at this point, you, be, you begin to become anomalous. Society is starting to, is starting to change, and you're... You're kind of holding on, and yeah. I wonder what's, what's happening inside you at this point in time. You know, they were very respectful because they were liberals, and liberals think everybody should be around, you know? But they were, I was treated well uh, because all viewpoints were being honored. Um, I, w- w- nothing was happening to me. I certainly wasn't having sex with anybody. But you were thinking about it? Uh, you wanted Only it? when I went to a certain toilet... In the basement of the English building. That's where all the good sex happens, by the way. And, and there were whole novellas written on the stalls in the bathroom. These sexy stories that went on and actually seemed to continue from week to week. So I could go in there and enjoy the, a cereal on the wall. Tales, tales of the shitty. The tale, yeah. <laughs> Oh, I love setting you up. <laughs> um, and did you ever get any in the toilet? Never. never. I never saw another person in there. Never. Are you I sure? Mean, it was the the walls were lacquered, you know, yeah. with the pleasure of the people who had been there. But I. <laughs> that is I the nicest say, way of I, saying something. I am so a gentleman. <laughs> I can't help it. Lacquered with the pleasure of the other people who had been there. How, de- how delightful. And so, but you were just standing there, you know, nothing... Not standing no, there, but... Oh, okay. Nothing was, nothing was happening. So, so, so and... and so we, that, that was, the, that's the, it, it was on the edges of life. It was, yeah. I didn't, I, I was heard that one end of the bar in Chapel Hill, the, mm. the regular bar, the mm. tempo room, became gay on Thursday nights or something. But I didn't go there for fear of being seen there on mm. Thursday nights. And I wasn't even beginning to look. I mean, I didn't... You were I was holding away. the lid on so hard. Yeah. You know. And there was, a, there was a boy that you were attracted to who was, yeah. who was at college. Tell us, about, tell us about him. We were in the uh, student legislature together, and everybody loved him. His name was Roger Davis. Um, he, uh, he had this sort of Frankie Avalon hair and <laughs> very smooth and beautiful dark eyes. And he and I would walk, we'd leave student legislature and walk across the campus together. He was in a brand new sort of high-rise dorm that was so dehumanizing that he had given it a new name. He'd called it Maverick House, and he'd ordered uh, cowboy hats in, in Pat Carolina blue. He was kind of like you, Damien, in that sense. He knew, how to, he knew how to round up the troops, you okay. know. This is true. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and so he was kind of worshipped, kind of like you. Um, uh, and he... Um, I won't let it get out of hand. I know, I know. I'm just wondering when I'm going st- <laughs> to... Yeah. And uh, I never expressed anything towards him. I just had a huge crush on him. And one day... Uh, Did think, he ever express anything towards no. you? No. Uh, no. He, he spent a lot of time with me, so I wondered about it later. But he was in a car accident that was bla- blazing across the front of the school paper in which he'd been traveling at 90 miles an hour and jumped a curb and hit an abutment and not died right away, but died at the hospital. And they said in the paper that it was a one-car accident. And there was a very blustery old campus police chief there, Chief Officer Beaumont, Mm. 
who I, I knew slightly, and he said, well, uh, I was on the scene, and that boy killed himself uh, because he was queer. And it, it made my blood run cold because in a strange sort of way, I, almost, I hoped that, almost hoped that was true, that he'd been like me, and that, and, that, and that maybe by extension, maybe he'd felt something towards me. Yeah. Not that he'd killed himself over me, but mm. I wondered if there was somebody else out there that he might have killed himself over. Uh, it brought me closer to him in a weird sort of way. And he was very loved by everyone on campus. There were lots of women that had huge crushes on him. And one of them got up at his memorial service and read that bit from Romeo and Juliet that's, uh, you know, when he shall die, take him and cut him out in little stars, et cetera. And she really played the scene, and it so pissed me off, because I, kn- <laughs> I knew she had never been his Juliet, you know. <laughs> and I, I went home in a terrible, terrible funk that day, and back to this little off-campus apartment that I yeah. had. And I heard this, uh, somebody coming, I went to sleep, and then I woke up, and I heard somebody coming down the path, and I opened the door, and it was Roger. And he said, uh, they made a the paper fucked up. That's another Roger Davis. It's not me. Uh, and I just thought you'd be the, want to be the first to know. And I hugged him and long, longer than I should have. I sort of stroked his hair and said how much I was afraid I was going to lose him. And I wanted him to know, uh, you know how much he had meant to me. And uh, then I woke up. And uh, I used that story when I entered a a competition in San Francisco. Three professors were sitting behind a desk. I came in. I didn't have any notes. I just got up and spoke from my heart about the need for all of us to say what's on our minds. I didn't say. I didn't come out uh, or, or even say anything to suggest that he had killed himself because he was gay. But I just basically spoke about how dreams can redeem us, but not if we haven't, you know, we have to act while people are alive. And I won the university's oldest oratorical medal, medal, something called the Mangum Medal, the Willie P. Mangum. I think it's actually called a Willie. Um, (laughs) uh, For doing that, and it was a lesson that I learned about writing even, that you could draw on the, the feelings of your own life and make people believe you by doing that. I think the, in the book I said, let them see enough yeah. to believe you. Yeah. So, so he, he, he died. He killed himself. You're hearing these messages from your father all around you that being a homosexual with a capital H is the worst possible thing that, that, that can happen. And you're, you're, you're internalizing all this. Are you, are you trying to... Uh, consciously talk yourself out of it? I mean, do you feel like you're mentally ill? I did. Uh, yeah. I, I thought, I knew that I was mentally ill and, the, and that doctors could treat it and that I, I tried repeatedly to work up the nerve to tell my parents. And I would sit there and sit in the living room and we were all watching TV and think, well, maybe after gun smoke when, <laughs> when my brother and sister are in bed and my grandmother's gone to sleep and maybe I can tell them then. I actually wanted electroshock therapy, thinking so I, could, uh, I could fix myself. Uh, and I, I felt as if I had tumbled into the abyss when I took my uh, American grandmother uh, to the beauty parlor one day and was waiting for her to get her hair done and wandered into this newspaper stand that was there uh, downstairs from the, in the hotel where the beauty parlor was. We called it the blind stand because a number of places were called blind stands because they were manned by blind people. They came from the blind school and, uh, and they would sell you the magazines and they had an honor system where you'd put the money into a little thing. I walked in there and I saw on the rack a magazine called Demigods, which was a piece of 1961... Uh, soft porn and there was a man on the cover that you know with a really beautiful chest and blonde hair and 
it looked like he was, I thought at the time that he was in satin sheets in bed, uh, but he was directly, he very clearly wanted me. Yeah. <laughs> and, and I wanted him, but I didn't dare. So Even, weren't the people selling it blind? They, yeah. No, I'm I, just saying, like, they could have picked it up, they wouldn't have known. I, I, I could have bought, told him it was time or field and stream or something. But your voice would have given it away. The voice would have, maybe, or maybe he had a, I, you know, I knew that people with, you know, ha, that had certain senses deprived developed the other ones. So I thought, he might be able to smell exactly where I am in the room. <laughs> And I, I left, I fled, yeah. uh, without ever picking it up off the stand, and went back to my Volkswagen and, uh, and turned on the radio, and there was a song that was popular at the time. It was called Walk on the Wild Side. It wasn't the Lou Reed song, but this was one that was written for a Jane Fonda movie about a prostitute in New Orleans. Had these sort of, you know, pom, 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 you know, yeah. you're going to hell music. And, uh, and I was certain that I was. Yeah. And I told this story about 10 years ago, 10 or maybe 15 now, to a young friend of mine. Uh, I mean, he must have been in his 20s then. And, and I said it was, you know, demigods. And he said, oh, my God, I've been taking care of an old guy. And um, he said, I'm, you know, I'm too old to use my porn anymore. So why don't you take my collection? So... He said, I think there's one in that collection. He came in the next day with this magazine. I said, that's not one of them. That's the very one. Uh, uh, the demigod. There he was. And uh, I could look at the whole magazine for the first time. <laughs> they had the total luxury of thinking, oh, here, I can just take my time with this. The, the guys had names like... Um, Troy Saxon, and <laughs> my favorite, Mike Nificent. <laughs> and they had, you know, posing straps. That's very special. Uh, yeah. And a little, there was a center, there was a commercial center that kind of reminded me of the, the comic books when I was a kid where there would be joy buzzers and sea monkeys. Did you have sea monkeys here? They were like brine shrimp that would come alive, and they, but the little drawings made it look like they were monkeys. It was very unsatisfactory. <laughs> and, Not the uh, only unsatisfactory yeah, image in that well, this was, this, These were the gay items, household items, in the center of this thing. They had like a 16-inch ebony pepper mill. <laughs> <laughs> you sure? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm perilously close to talking about the time change story. That the, oh yes, that's a say it. Well, it may, it. I just told it was true. Uh, Graham Norton said today that some some woman uh, on the air said, uh, "Now remember every now remember everybody, uh, uh, remember to turn your cocks black tonight." <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you can. Um, on that note, we're going to go to an interval. You can go and get a gin and tonic. We'll be back in 20 minutes. <laughs> there we are. And on that note, we'll go out. All right. Good. Oh, that was so polished. That was very slick, I feel. Did everybody have a lovely, lovely interval? I did. I'm, I had a lot of the wine, sorry, uh, back in the room. Um, so I realised that we didn't even get to San Francisco in the first half, so Armistead, smoothly, let's just skip Vietnam. How did you... <laughs> you would if you could. Um, how did you get to San Francisco, and what was it like when you got there? I was uh, in an Opel GT... Do you remember those cars? They, they, look like, they were little mini Corvettes. You had to sort of lie down to drive it. Um, drove across the country. I was interrupted by um, 
a call when I got to the Mississippi River from the White House. That's very glamorous. Shall I tell that story? <laughs> yes, tell the story. Um, I had done this project of taking Viet Vietnam veterans back to Vietnam to build houses for disabled Vietnamese veterans. It was all a setup, a total setup by the White House to make Nixon look like he cared about veterans. And, uh, but I went, naturally. I mean, you know, we got, a, got this call, and they said, the president wants to see you in the Oval Office on Tuesday. So I showed up there with the other 10, ten guys that had done this project with me and uh, immediately sensed how ill at ease he was. He was, you know, he was not comfortable in this social situation with a 10, 25-year-old men. And he started out sort of stiff and then tried to be one of the guys, you know. And then he said something to the effect of, you know, the, the, the Vietnamese women are not all that attractive, uh, but when they wear their little owl yais, uh and they ride their bicycles, they, they're like little butterflies. And it was creepy beyond belief. <laughs> And, and, uh, and he was doing this buddy-buddy, you know, girl, guy, you know, pussy talk, yeah. basically, yeah. with the only queer in the room. <laughs> uh, and I told that story to uh, Douglas Brinkley, a journalist, a few years back. And he said, he came back to me and said, well, your story pans out. It's a little bit better than you made it, but it pans out. And I said, what do you mean it pans out? He said, well, I listened to the tapes. I said, oh. I was on the fucking Watergate tapes. And it was worse than you remember. Thank God it panned out because I was afraid that I'd made the story too much, you know, Im improved on it a little bit, which I can do. Um, and you have a really creepy picture of you shaking hands with President Nixon. Yeah, and I kept it in my little house on the roof in San Francisco. Your little pent shack. Yeah, for way too long, really. <laughs> and I realized it was scaring the fuck out of the guys I was dragging home from Polk Street. <laughs> <laughs> they had that look of, uh, did I just come home with Jeffrey Dahmer? <laughs> Uh, so and so gradually, I mean, I I met people in San Francisco that were far straight people mm. that were far more comfortable with with my gayness than I was. So I mean, you, at that point, you, you get to San Francisco in your in your little car with your picture of Nixon, which is creepy. Um, and Don't forget you, the picture of my my Confederate general grandfather, which I also had in the back seat. <laughs> Jesus, it's all the o sex only in the your essential. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and so you, you get there and you find the, the first place you stay is, is the Pent Shack, which is the... Yeah, that was pretty much yeah. the... I mean, I had a place, I had a place that was off of uh, Lafayette Park, mm. which I discovered very early on was a cruisy park. I didn't even know what that was at the time, but yeah. uh, I would go and roam around in that park at night. And, uh, but the Pent Shack was the first permanent one, and it was this little... Uh, you had to wind up some steps on the side of a house, through a garden and the side of the house, and then <coughs> onto the roof. And here's this really one-room studio with a breathtaking view of the bay. It's in Tales of the City. The, uh, the creepy child molester lives there. And, <laughs> um, and uh, I loved it, and I loved my life there, and I loved that I could walk down you know, the hill to Dave's Baths, the place I was talking about, until I started walking all the way across town to other bathhouses that I was finding. And, uh, and I was trying to be a journalist. Uh, so I, uh, well, I'd quit the Associated Press, the people that brought me there. I couldn't stand it. I was just bored to death. Uh, and they, you didn't have a byline. There was no stardom were involved in writing for the for wire service. Press, yeah, yeah I, I, I had to leave. And... Uh, so I started doing freelance pieces, things that interested me around town. I'd write about the nude encounter girls on, on Broadway. Uh, I wrote about an event that was held down at California Hall by a transgender woman that, who was, had yet to complete her transition. And she threw a party where she invited one of the big bands, the remnants of one of the big bands, like Tommy Dorsey, 
to play, and they were and it was all old straight people slow dancing out on the dance floor to pay for uh, her surgery, and she had named it the Ball to End All Balls. <laughs> I loved her. I mean, I, you know, that she could make that joke and, and, and do this. And she had invited Sally Rand to entertain. Sally Rand was known as being a famous fan dancer in the 1930s. Oh, yeah. yeah. Sally Rand fans were there. <laughs> she had these big white fans, and she was supposedly naked behind them. But she moved them so quickly you couldn't quite tell. And at 70, she performed that dance albeit under a three-watt blue bulb. <laughs> uh, at California Hall. And I t- took her and uh, Kate Marlowe out to lunch the next day and bought Sally a birthday cake. And uh, It was a really... It, it was what, I just started seeing how the city could be, yeah. that you could find these interesting people. And So and, by this, at this point, you were having... Um, you said, I think you say in the book that you were really enjoying being a slut at that point yes. in your life. Oh. Um, don't tart people from Hove. Um, <laughs> um, um, yeah, actually, you were I had somebody having... say that to me. I went home from, from Lafayette Park, the, that cruisy park I was talking about, with a guy one, one lunchtime, and he was in an apartment overlooking the, the park, and... Uh, and I assumed he was sing- single. I don't. Well, I just didn't know how that could work sometimes. And his partner came home, awkward, and did this whole Jacqueline and Suzanne thing, call, yelling at me, not at him, but at me, slut, get out of my bed, slut, <laughs> throwing my clothes at me as I escaped. You know, ran down the hallway. And Are you I was sure they hadn't arranged this as a kind of scene. Uh, I guess it's possible. Yeah, I know it's possible. I I was amused by it. I thought it was hilarious. (laughs) I loved being a slut. (laughs) That's a lovely badge or a Christmas card, I think, right there. So so you're having you're having great time being a slut, but where are you out to people? I mean, were you out to people you worked with yet? You were starting to come out to people around you, but I think not yet your family. Uh, Not my family, but to the whole city of San Francisco, pretty much. Yeah, my best friend, um, uh, a, a woman that uh, called me baby cakes, red-headed woman who called me baby cakes. She was married, and she had a couple of kids, and I came over to her house one night after I'd had two or three Mai Tais. Yes, the very drink that Franny Halcyon yeah. drinks <laughs> was my favorite, and, uh, and said, I have something to tell you, Jan, and got all, you know, quivery about it and she said what is it what is it and I said I'm homosexual and she came over and took my hands in hers and knelt in front of me and said big fucking deal (laughs) um so you got that level of acceptance from people you didn't know from from the beginnings of your logical family. Yeah. And so let's talk about um, the moment that you write about in the book. And the book is the book is very beautifully written and is in some ways um, it's very different from Tales of the City in that it's your voice. You're not hiding behind fiction um, or behind the characters. And the book is full of loads of those gorgeous clues like baby cakes and things like that. Um, but you know you, you're 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 writing with your your own voice for for the first time about about coming out and you know being yourself and I wonder how the column came out of that like you know was were the two things happening in parallel you were starting to come out and you were and you were starting to get you know a reputation as a journalist absolutely in parallel uh I I did a wanted to do a story about the heterosexual cruising scene at the marina safeway where the (laughs) You know. Not Brighton Marina Safeway. I just want to be good. <laughs> Nothing good ever happened in that Asda. Do you no, have? I... <laughs> you have a Marina Safeway. We here? have a Marina Asda, which is really not oh. the same thing. <laughs> Nobody in the Asda and the Marina has Hollandaise. Asda. I'm just gonna... Asda. Asda. Don't let's just gloss over that. Okay. So, 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 so you know, you 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 write in the book. You say you never know when your moment's going to come. Yeah, and this really was your moment. The that Marina was it. Safeway was your moment. That was it. I went down there. 
on a Wednesday night and saw all these people cruising the vegetable aisles, <laughs> you know, bumping their carts into each other and discussing zucchinis and really <laughs> subtle. <laughs> and, and, uh, but I couldn't find anybody that would say, yes, I and this came down people. to the... Uh, straight people. Straight yeah. people. Dirty. <laughs> Nobody would say, yes, I'm, I'm here to get fucked tonight, I, you know. <laughs> so I went home and I invented this new girl in town, Mary Ann Singleton, and told a story in which she's assailed by creeps. And finally she meets this charming guy that she really likes and has some hope about. And uh, he's there with Michael Tolliver at the Marina Safeway. And... Um, the editor of the paper, it was very successful. It sort of struck a nerve with a lot of women in town who were finally figuring out why so many of these attractive men were unavailable. <laughs> and uh, so he, I, he said, would you follow Mary Ann? And I said, yes, and if I can follow Michael Tolliver, too. Yeah. So I did about five um, stories over, over five weeks before that little newspaper folded. But I, it had been spotted by a senior editor at the Chronicle, mm. who uh, was hardly, a, he's a, an e, almost more unlikely than Jesse Helms touting my writing at the beginning. This was like a hard drinking <coughs> Irishman who was very homophobic and misogynist, and, uh, but he really liked me and um, took me under his wing and said, uh, I'll get you in to meet the editors, see about doing something like this for the Chronicle. So I went in to meet the editor, and, and, uh, and he said, can you do this forever? <laughs> Five days a week, forever. And I said, of course. <laughs> 800 words. 800 day. words a day, five days a week, forever. And how far ahead did you write? I, they wanted six weeks' worth which is 30, yeah. um, and uh, I gobbled that up pretty fast. But the, and I, I met, during that time, when I was waiting, I was, they still hadn't really given me the green light. During that time was when I went to Palm Springs and ended up meeting Rock Hudson, and he, um, the night before Tales of the City appeared. Oh, this is a delicious story. Just, <laughs> yeah, go on. <laughs> the night before Tales of the City appeared, yeah. he stood up in the Fairmont Hotel diplomat suite uh, and said, I've got a little reading I'd like to do. He'd been to the, down to the desk and bought the early edition of the newspaper, and he read the first chapter of Tales of the City to all of us. The first chapter has Mary Ann, if you remember, on the phone to her mother back in Cleveland saying, I'm coming home. And her mother says, you can't do that. It's dangerous there. Your father and I were just watching Macmillan and Wife. <laughs> and there are serial, serial killers on the loose. And uh, there was Macmillan. Amazing. Reading this to me. Um, and it was meant to charm the pants off me. And it, you know, it did. <laughs> I remember looking at my, my horoscope that week thinking, what is happening to me? You know? <laughs> and he was a huge star, wasn't he? <laughs> <laughs> Which is one Hugely of the... intimidating. Yeah. He, he, said, he, he said, you say he said something like... Yeah, he, he said uh, it was very sweet because, I mean, I just was totally not coming through for the moment. And uh, one of the things that killed me was that he had a little black leather case for his poppers, his real poppers, which is very hoity-toity. Uh, and it said R.H. on it. I th I'm looking at Rock Hudson's popper case <laughs> and what it's meant to accompany. <laughs> and and uh, we, we just, it didn't, I couldn't get it up. Basically. That's what I'm trying to say. <laughs> and he sat next to me and put his arm around me and said, you know, I'm just another guy like you. And I said, no, you're not, yeah. and I'm Doris Day. <laughs> <laughs> so 
Um, so you're, you're writing however many weeks ahead, 800 words a day. The, the pressure of that is, is enormous. You must be looking around the city all the time, looking for stories, trying to kind of co-opt co the real into it. And um, how did real people feel about being incorporated into your stories, or at least hinted at? I mean, Watt Hudson is obviously hinted at and much later. Later on, yeah. yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, just, most were happy about it. Some actually auditioned for it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they wanted to be in it because everybody's reading it. It was sort of the thing yeah. in the morning to read it. And I, as you say, I was just desperately grabbing at anything I could find. One night, I was down at the Twin Peaks, which is still there. Yeah. Uh, it was the first gay bar in America to have uh, plate glass windows where you could actually see who the patrons were. I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, a really good... And a lot of old people have always gone there. That's why they call it the glass casket, which is really lovely. <laughs> and I, w but I was sitting there one night and, uh, and being hit on by this really kind of hot, preppy guy. And uh, he took me home and said, you know what it was that really turns me on about you? He said, you're Ouija's. We don't have those. You don't have those no. here, do you? They're loafers. They're penny loafers. They're kind of a, a, you know, a preppy signifier. Kind of like slightly sexless slip-ons. Yeah. Yeah. That's what it got him going. Got him going. And I realized what he meant when I got to his house. And he had framed pictures of Ouijans on, <laughs> on the wall of his living room. And... I found out subsequently that he was the night clerk at the Huntington Hotel, which was, at that point, was one of the few places left in town that would shine your shoes if you left them outside the door of your hotel room at night. And what did he shine the shoes I with? don't really want to think of <laughs> The lacquered pleasure. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> of the Ouijans. Um, so, so you're writing this column about, you know, Michael and Mona and Marianne and all these wonderful people, Mrs. Magical. Um, and were your parents reading it? All these M people, by the all way. The all the M's. Do you think M's. there was an ego thing going on there? I, there I'm are saying. AMs, too. Mary Ann, Anna Magical. They're me, all the me, anagrams. Me, me, me. <laughs> yeah. um, but they are all refractions of you, and I think that's yeah. one of the interesting things that, yeah. you, that you're very honest about in this memoir. You say that, you know, they are all refractions of you, and the book is full of clues about who they might be, and, you know, um, there are different elements, I think, of different people, but really the main source of them, um, of course, is you. And you say, I think, in the book that um, you are different characters at different points in your yeah. life, or you have been, and I wonder which of the characters you feel you're kind of coming into now. Are you solidly one, or are you, are you changing from one to Am the I other? Anna yet? Is that what I'm you're not asking? saying anything. <laughs> I'd like to be. I don't think I'm that evolved, but uh, um, yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. I'm not sure I'm any of them. All of them, just all of them. Yeah, I mean, in the recent books, the last three books, uh, Michael is a Michael is a, a you know an aging gay man with a partner who's 30 years younger. So that I've certainly been able to use some of my own life in that. <laughs> Armistead's hot husband is in the Princess Margaret Memorial. It's <laughs> a very good story. Yes, exactly, in the whole Burning Man. Wave, series. honey. He's gonna wa he's Where is we he? We told him how to wave like Princess Margaret. Uh, oh, yeah. oh, hi, sir. When, he, when he said, how do you wave like Princess Margaret, I went like that. <laughs> he didn't do it. He didn't do it. I can't, anyway, so, so, so anyway, everybody in America, he's too cute for that. Everybody in America is reading your column, but, um, your, and your parents presumably are thrilled because you're successful, you're not a Kelly girl yeah. anymore, you can you know, have a slightly bigger apartment, all of those things. So I, I think one of the most moving... I love the way you threw that away. You're not a Kelly girl anymore. He was a Kelly girl for a while. Yeah. That's fine. Um, they and, told me to wear a... Uh, you, it was, it's a... It's a employment service, and because the assumption was that all menial jobs were filled by women, they called it Kelly Girl, and so I applied for, to them for, for work of some sort, and they, they sent me a notice that said, be sure to wear a conservative skirt when you report for work. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so. You, you wrote Michael's letter to Mama, which you wrote in 45 minutes, um, and you wrote that incredible piece of literature which has been used by so many people. 
um, all around the world as a way of coming out to their parents. It's been set to music. It's incredibly moving. Um, I read it again last week and was just as moved by it again as when I read mm. it for the first time. And you wrote that as a way of, as a way of telling your parents. In a, slight, uh, in a very cowardly way, really, because... Well, I mean, in a national news bill, you know. Yeah. Probably not yet, well... You know. Well, it's, it's the confrontation thing that I've yeah. always avoided. Um, and I, I knew they'd know it was me, and I wanted to be eloquent about it, and I wanted to get down every word, yeah. and I wanted to be very, very clear that, that I was happy being out and gay and... Um, because my mother w was suffering less about uh, the fact of it than what she thought, what she was imagining for my future. Mm. She had cancer at that point. She knew she didn't have long to live. She said um, to me, I know uh, this is fun right now when you're young. And she didn't say horny, but that's what she was thinking. Uh, and, uh, but what is it going to be like when you're old? <laughs> she, I wish she could see. I could have seen it. You know, she was, you know, an amateur actress, and uh, and uh, to, to to not be an actor and be on this stage and to actually get to perform in a way yeah. is an amazing thing. But but she said it'll hurt. I'm just afraid it'll hurt your career. And I said. Uh, but mummy, that's what I called her, um, it is my career. I, I knew it then. I knew it 40 years ago. I knew that it was me and that I could, by putting out the truest version of myself, I could have the greatest success. Professionally and personally. Professionally, pro professionally and personally. Yeah. Uh, I realized that it was... There was no downside to it at all. And the other people I knew, people like Harvey Milk, for instance, felt the same way. His downside was a really lousy one. Yeah. He got murdered. But, um, and we all knew that somebody could take a pot shot at us in a, in a gay pride parade. I think anybody who's ever ridden in one thinks that, that there could be a madman up there in the window. Well, there's a picture somewhere. of you with Laura Linney in the back of the car. It's yeah. very JFK. You're, you're there and you're so happy. But also there is a shade of Oh, that's a, a grim. Of <laughs> well, you know. Yeah, can, yeah, but it's there. Yeah, it is there. It is there. Um, and that was, I think, I think what's interesting is talking to you in this moment here and now in a city like this, not quite perhaps in a cultural moment. I think we're not as secure as we thought we were, but particularly in America with, with, with Trump, um, but, you know, then, you know, you were writing something that was completely pioneering. It was completely groundbreaking. This is the first, you know, serial in a national or semi-national newspaper which showed gay people having good lives, having happy lives. You were the first person to write about AIDS, a death from, from AIDS as, as well as that. So, you know, you were, you know, you were treading new territory. What, what was the feedback like from people at the time? And this is before the Internet, which I think is a... An interesting yeah, well, I could hold their right. attention for that reason. They, it, everybody in San Francisco read that paper in the morning. Yeah. So it was wonderful to have that big audience and know that I was holding them and keeping them in suspense yeah. and leading them into a story that they never would have gotten into yeah. if I had tricked them. Yeah. Uh, it was very, very uh, satisfying. Um, and so when you wrote Michael's Letter to Mama, did you, you, your parents never... What did, what did they do? They did. My father sent a little, very terse little note on his, uh, on his legal pad that says, as you know, your mother is very ill, and any, any uh, further disruption can only hasten the end of her life. He basically said, you're stop your this, mother. you're killing your mother. Yeah. Uh, fortunately, I was in communication with her all the time, and I knew she wasn't feeling that way about me. And they did come out to San Francisco. This is a wonderful moment. Please, please share that. Um, they said, we, you know, we'd like to come out and meet your friends. And I was so excited about that because I was very proud of my friends and my logical family at the time. And uh, so they came out uh, to San Francisco on the weekend that George Moscone and Harvey Milk were assassinated. And... Um, my friend Dave Copay, who was the first professional athlete in America to come out, yeah. um, 
was going was throwing a party for me like a lunch for my parents and and uh and I <coughs> spoke to him that morning when we were all just reeling from the news mm. and I uh, said should we call this off and he said no I want to be with you guys mm. and we realized I mean it made perfect sense I, I wanted to be with us too you know so I took my parents over to David's house who was above all even though he was a proud homosexual a jock so the Kentucky Fried Chicken was the, was the brunch that he had worked out for us. <laughs> and he took my father into his bedroom to show him some Polaroids that he had taken of a couple that he'd had a three-way with, a straight couple. <laughs> Thinking my father would appreciate <laughs> the picture of the naked woman. And uh, Daddy came out of his, out of the bedroom and said, "What's the matter with that fellow? Doesn't he know he's queer?" <laughs> he, <laughs> that that's the good side of him that we never talked about. He had a serious sense of humor and he knew how to work it. Yeah. When we uh, we I said we really I hate to end this. I mean, my parents were going home that evening. And your mother was my and it was, your mother it was, was really dying. my mother's farewell visit. Yeah. And, and, and said, we really want to be part of the uh, candlelight march. Uh, so they, my mother was really sweet about it and said, oh, I know that's important to you, and uh, I'm getting a little tired anyway, so we can talk later. And so we piled into David's little Toyota, black Toyota pickup, and my mother was in front with David because she was a little weak, and my father was in the back all hunched up with six homosexuals one of whom lit a joint and began to pass it around. <laughs> and the old man grabbed it and took a toke off of it. And, oh my God. and I think I squealed, Daddy! You know? <laughs> and he said, well, i got to do something. Your mother's up front with that goddamn bisexual. <laughs> <laughs> and how did, the rest, how did the rest of that evening play well, out? Well, we... we uh, we went down to the march we, to join it at uh, Castro Street and uh, uh, Castro and Market, and it, it, it was growing. I know you've seen pictures of that amazing yeah. evening. It was a sea of silent candlelight, just one of the most beautiful things I've ever seen. Uh, it was just the silence was going to be the eloquent thing. And we got part in, into it, and we headed down towards um, City Hall where the, um, the ceremony was to be held. And uh, my friend, Daniel Katz, who was very, I mean, he must have been 21 then, and he died four years later of AIDS. He was one of the, he's the reason I killed off Dr. John Fielding in Tales of the City, because I wanted people to feel the impact of what was happening. Mm. And uh, Daniel grabbed my arm and said, look over there. And 40 feet away, he had spotted my parents who had not gone back to their hotel, as they said they would, but had followed the candlelight mm. into, the, into the plaza. And he said, go get them, go get them. So I went over and I you know, took their arms and I led them up to the stage. And uh, my mother said, that, that, woman's is, that woman's voice is beautiful. Joan Baez was singing uh, Amazing Grace. Well, my father had hated Joan Baez <laughs> ever since the Vietnam War. And, uh, and when my mother said, who is she? And I said, that's Joan Baez. And she said, oh, dear. <laughs> <laughs> Always a trial with that man, you know. And uh, I said, uh, it's okay. What he doesn't know won't hurt him. Um, so... So they were there for yeah. that moment with yeah. me, uh, you know, accepting me and my friends, seeing my friends and accepting me. And how the universe made that happen, I will never exactly figure out, you know. Uh, we're we're going to go to audience questions in a bit, and I have I have some of your cards here. But um, just before we before we get to that, um, this is a kind of cultural activism that you, that you're in, engaging in at this point. And when the books followed from the columns, I know that in the UK some of them were 
impounded by customs on their way to gaze the ward. Um, where I've doing... never been prouder. It was so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, you know, how, how, how did that... Is that the moment that kind of galvanised you from being a, a, a culture of a activist into being a full-blown political activist as, as well? As uh, no, not that particular moment. I was already off and running by yeah, then. Yeah. But I loved the fact that it was happening here and that I, my books could say something about that horrid woman and what she was trying to do with yeah. Clause 28. Yeah, hateful. Uh, yeah, yeah. There, there, there was, I think, another moment, which is um, when Tales of the City was commissioned as a, as a, a miniseries, um, and which was fantastic. And I, rem I remember watching it um, in, in secret and being completely thrilled by it and thinking Mouse was just so hot. Um, <laughs> and, you know, wanting to, you know, be in that safe way. Um, not the Asda, the safe way. Um, and, but, you know, it was, it, there was a huge kind of culture war over, over that show. People thought that it was disgusting. Led by Jesse Helms, my Led old boss. Your old boss. Amazing. So it was just, you know... Uh, there's a shape to this where things from the past come back yeah. to the present and allow me to fix them, as it were. Um, it, it was the, considered the first fight in the modern culture war that they attacked PBS for, uh, you know, spending taxpayer mon money on, on this rich, wretched thing. The head of the American Family Association in this documentary on me um, says in the documentary, thank God it's there, he says, We've got taxpayer money so that two men, gay men, can have anal sex with each other. <laughs> I had to listen to it a couple times before I realized what he was saying. Anal. <laughs> it was canned. The show was canned. But the good news is that Netflix are bringing Tales of the City back yes. next year, right? Yeah. Um... Uh, I was, it happened this week, officially, the deal. Um, uh, and Who's going to be in it? Is Laura Linney in it? You is, bet she is. Yes, yeah, she is. <laughs> Fabulous. She, Marianne is 53. Don't do the math on this or it'll get really confusing. <laughs> Marianne is 53 and coming back to San Francisco after a long absence with a terrible secret that is troubling her. Mrs. Madrigal, in the opening episode, the way it stands right now, um, is celebrating her 90th birthday party. Fabulous. And uh, some of the old characters are there, uh, and there's some new ones. There's some new, um, a more racially diverse, I'm happy to say, Good. crowd at, at 28 Barbary Lane. And uh, Jake, the trans man that I invented 10 years ago, a character I'm really proud of, is, uh, is going to be there. And uh, we just got to get it underway. As Olympia pointed out to me on the phone the other day, rather gruffly, said, if you don't want to get this goddamn thing going, I'm going to have to perform the whole thing lying down. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so I'm going to go to some audience questions here. The first one is actually just a phone number. So we're going to skip that one. Are there any? But, I mean, I don't know what's going to happen to it. I, you may, I might pass it to you. Um, what does it say? Um, it just says, call me, and then there's a phone number. So <laughs> anyway, I won't read the phone number out, but anyway, it's probably on the toilet wall. Um, <laughs> what's it like living in San Francisco these days? I mean, I think this is one of the wonderful things about the book is that the, it's a time capsule. At the beginning, people are on landlines. They're taking quaaludes. Now they're taking different drugs. They're texting each other. I mean, it's a whole... And Trump is president. And Trump is president. <laughs> Yeah, you predicted that. So what is, it, what is it like now? Is it the spirit the same? Um, there are people that fall in love with it for the same reason. Mm. Uh, a lot of these techie kids that are disparaged are there with their yoga mats and their whatever, their mystical whatever going on. They're ten times richer than I will ever be, but they love the city for the same reasons. They're yeah. charmed by it in the same yeah. ways. They don't quite get it right. I was reading the other day that... Um, you know about Burning Man, I guess. Everybody know about Burning Man, the festival in the desert. Uh, Chris, my husband, dragged me there one time, and then I went willingly the second time. Yeah. Not that much dragging. I mean, uh, well, no, I mean, well, yeah, it yeah. was initially. It's, a, it's an effort. Fortunately, he made clothes for me and sewed things and drove the RV and <laughs> pretty much did everything. 
Um, but uh, there's a, the Google Google has a camp at Burning Man now, and they were in, they were flying in live lobsters from Maine <laughs> to consume at Burning Man. That's not exactly the spirit of this festival. No, 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 no. So there are. Um, it's different. It, it is different. The city. Could it's you? still beautiful, but. Uh, and maybe things could be fixed by some huge catastrophe of some sort <laughs> that would... Uh, Trump isn't a big enough catastrophe. Well, I mean... An actual uh, earthquake. You're overdue. <laughs> I mean, Anna's yeah. been saying it for the last nine books. You're, over, yeah, she, you're, yeah. you're, you're overdue. She has been. Yes. She has. It is true. Um, so um, here's a question. Do you think Tales of the City could have happened in any other American city, i.e. Chicago or New York, I guess? I suppose if someone had been clever enough to write it... <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know, they did. Tr there, there were copies of it after the first year. It yeah. was in the paper. A lot of American newspapers tried it. Oh, really? A Chicago so they, they paper, a Washington paper. They did it, but they got some guy off the city desk. Yeah. And you know, they didn't have their heart in it, and they certainly didn't have a queer who was coming out of the closet while it was going on. You know. Yeah. It was coming out of my heart and soul as I was writing it. Yeah. And. Um, it was a live memoir in the sense. It was a live of, memoir, yeah. and people got that and hooked in with it. Yeah. Um, another phone number. Um, You're kidding me. No, I'm not. There's more out the back that I couldn't oh, even God. bring out. Um, we kind of answered this one already. Are you Michael Tolliver? I mean, I guess... You, you not are, anymore, honey, so stop yeah, sending okay. me your phone number. Okay. <laughs> Um, okay, I think we might have the house lights up so that people can shout their phone numbers at Armistead with a microphone. <laughs> Just, um, should we have the house lights and shall we have the... We've got some roving mics. Um, and I know that some of you do have questions which aren't just kind of rambling comments um, or phone numbers. Um, so if you want to put your hand up, somebody will come to you um, with a microphone. Go for it. There's somebody there on the first level. I think it's the Royal Circle. I don't know which row it is. I, I mean, I think we've kind of answered this in a sense, which is how do you think San Francisco has changed? Yeah, that, but, that is... Uh... But in interesting ways, actually, it's com comparable to Brighton. We said San Francisco of the South at the beginning, and I used to go to San Francisco a lot. I, we saw, I saw you there in January. But it's a, it's a city which has got lots of big tech industry and then all this kind of poverty. At, at the yeah, side there's a huge disparity between the rich and the poor in San Francisco. Oh, he meant, oh. He meant which bars do you go to? Well... <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, and I've, uh, yeah. I, I well, the bathhouses are closed. Yeah, are, they are. Are there new ones? Or there, no, uh, no, there's one that's still always been there over in Oakland. Um, that's like suburbia. But it is really run out of grinder. And, uh, I'm, and I'm not going to be one of those old queens that gripes about grinder, about the convenience of it. <laughs> you know, it says... Uh, in my day, we had to walk 20 miles through the snow just to suck a cock. <laughs> Graham Norton was so afraid I was going to say that on the radio today. Um, next... Well, I mean, I suppose we kind of answered that question, but I think what's interesting is the way that, you know, the scene has changed and people have been, become more integrated um, and, you know, it's le less ghettoized, it's more yeah, diffused. Yeah, I, I like... We live in the Castro. Yeah. Right yeah. in the heart of the Castro, and I like the f fact that there are straight people moving in there and pushing their strollers down the street to compete with the gay people with their strollers. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, a, it's lovely. Yeah. And anybody who moves there yeah. is obviously going to be friendly. So it is sort of Barbary Lane realized in a, an interesting way. Barbary Lane's just getting bigger, I think, in yeah. San Francisco. But what's it like in the rest of America? I mean, what does it feel like to you living in Trump's America, particularly you talked about your brother being a Trump voter. I mean, these fault lines run through the country. Yeah. They run through your own family. Yeah, I said to the reporter at the Financial Times, I th it feels like America's lost its gag reflex. <laughs> it's... <laughs> 
We that's the first time that's been said at lunch with the FT. They're like, oh, yeah. what does that mean? We can't say anything. <laughs> um, yeah, he wouldn't say to suck a cock in the snow. I fed it yeah. to him, but he wouldn't. Um, uh, it's horrifying that we've accepted not just the political end of it, but such an atrocious human being who's been around for a long time, showing us his dark, dark heart and his exactly who he is. And it's terrifying to think that this, you know, narcissistic baby has got his access to the nuclear button uh, and is picking fights with a similarly narcissistic baby in, you know, in North Korea. They found each other, those two idiots. Um, Free Melania. I'm just going to say that again. I love, <laughs> I love saying that. Free Melania. Um, other questions from a gentleman here in the white T-shirt and then the gentleman there probably in a gray T-shirt. Melania is, knows what she's doing, I by think the she way. knows what she's doing. She bought into that, so I have no sympathy for her. Hi. Um, first of all, Damien, amazing. Thank you so much for the, tonight. Um, Armistead, amazing talk. But, um, and you've touched on it briefly. Um, my question is, my first experience of your literature was, was at 12 years old, watching the Channel 4 adaptation of the first Tales of the City book. And I just wondered how you felt that that, ad that adaptation, how, 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 did you, how did you feel that that aligned with your imagination of the actual original book, and how did that fit with your I vision? loved that, that Channel 4 adaptation. I thought it was brilliant. I stayed away from some of the casting because I didn't want to demand that they look the way that I imagined some of them looked. But uh, Alistair Reed, the brilliant Scottish director, um, just really got it, got the playfulness of it, the, the, the elements of suspense. Uh, we were very happy about it and always having to live up to it. When we had to go to French Canada, to shoot the subsequent ones, it, it was required some diligence um, because it's another culture. And uh, I, mean, I remember we went on the set, uh, set one day and there was a, um, <laughs> we, had, we had reconstructed the pent shack, which was actually built on the roof of the police station in San Francisco. We had to do it in the studio. And uh, they bought a trans light, you know, this big, um, photographic reproduction of a skyline that they were very proud of. And I had to say to Pierre Gang, our director, it's beautiful, but it's Oakland. <laughs> <laughs> and it was, very, it was a very ten sensitive yeah. issue about, oh, you don't think that we in Canada can do these things, you know. <laughs> he was really bothered. But I was trying to be really nice about it, and I was trying to lighten things up. So I went to the soundstage next door and spoke to a guy that was starring in the Barney movie. The you dinosaur? Know, the dinosaur. Oh, okay. His name was, I remember his name was uh, Kersey because he was the brother of Jackie Joyner Kersey, the, the runner. And I really liked him, and a couple of weeks later he was busted for pot. Uh, so I liked Barney him. the dinosaur was Barney the Paul. dinosaur. Okay. So I asked him if he would come over and play a little joke on our set. So when we were shooting the scene where, um, I think it's the one where um, Brian is actually jerking off in the window to Lady Eleven across yeah. the way, yeah. I had Barney walk across the skyline of Oakland. <laughs> Everybody loved it, and it stopped things cold because people were getting autographs for their children. <laughs> <laughs> and Pierre was not happy with me. But, but you actually uh, appear in some of the... You, you have a lot of cameos here and there, right? Yeah, the, Al, that was the idea of Alistair Reed, the director of yeah. the first one, who said I should be sitting up in the window and typing while Michael and uh, Brian are down sunbathing in the garden. And... Uh, so it became a tradition. So you do, you do the typing in the window. You do, you're a priest at some point? I am a, I'm a priest in the second one, and I'm coming out of the glory holes in the third one. Which was actually real. That was a documentary. Well, 
I've always maintained that it was the same person. He was typing his sermon in the first one. (laughs) 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 Okay, uh, a question from the gentleman there in the the gray T-shirt. Yes, you. It's coming to you. The microphone is coming. Hi. Um, Hi. First of all, after quite a few years ago, after reading your book, that made me go to San Francisco. Um, I've been a few times, but the first time I went is I was informed that I was a bear. I'd never been told that before, but that's where I found out. Um, Did my you get question. Like a special card. Yeah, 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 yeah. My question was, what was your experience of bear culture, kind of back in the day in San Francisco, and how do you think it's changed? This is like the, this is a question about the clan of the cave bears. Bear memories, the early yeah. Bears. Um, when did so bear start identify? to be used as a term? When did bear start? Uh, I think. Well, I have it in. Uh, I have it in the night listeners. So that was almost 20 years ago, because they were all hanging out at the coffee shop there in the Castro. Um, so it's been going on that long. Um, and I, 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 for Christopher and I have gone to Bear Week in Provincetown for six years in a row. Um, and I have actually tried out a lot of the memoir on stage there to bears. Um, the effort behind Bear, the notion that they are nice, they're proud of being nice, is a pretty cool thing. Yeah. That's my favorite part of it. And a lot of people, you know, it's a particular male erotic uh, archetype that just expands uh, the, the world of who gets laid. <laughs> because, no, because now you get to be... A polar bear. I am a polar bear. (laughs) (laughs) I am a proud polar bear. Um, Yeah, you do. And that's true of the bears in general. I mean, they they accept all ages. They can get just as grand as any other queens. Uh, There are muscle bears who will, you know, not pay any attention to other kinds of bears. Um, I've, I know this because I was pathetically, I was standing out on the main street in P-Town with postcards saying, would you come to my show tonight? And um, Some of them just really gave me attitude. Who is this? Um, but uh, uh, I like bears. I think it's fun. I like meeting bears. I like go- we like going, we, we stopped off at the, at the, what's it called? The King... Uh, King's Arms. Thank it's you, darling. 500 people shout the King's That's Arms. That's my husband yeah. shouting oh, it. Seen the King's Arms. Uh, oh, I've seen the pictures. Yeah. At the King's Arms? Yeah, some yeah. of the pictures. Some of the pictures. Yeah. Uh, so it's uh, just one more thing. Thank you for your bear question. I love that. Um, <laughs> other endangered animal questions? <laughs> or indeed any Embittered other? Embittered otters. Lady, lady with the sequins and the amazing... <laughs> um, I, yeah, I won't. Yeah, lady with the sequins and the, the, the microphone's coming to you. Oh, yes, Rebecca. How are you? Nice to see you, too. Hi. I apologize in advance for the heterosexualness of my question. Um, I wanted to ask you about the Your character. jacket makes up for it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God, I love you. Um, <laughs> I wanted to ask about the character of Brian. I think Brian is really, really interesting, especially now in terms of, I think, toxic masculinity and what's going on in the news and, you know, men in their groping and famous men in their groping and how Brian seems super enlightened and on it and great in so many ways, but also sort of terrible in a very human and understandable way in lots of other ways. Yeah. Um, what do you think, you know, if Brian was sort of in his 30s now, how do you think he'd be affected by sort of masculine culture that's around? Would he take a stand against it, or do you think he would be sort of as bad as some of the other? Well, he's going to be in the, the character is in the new tales, the one that will be set in 2018, and he's Marianne's ex-husband. Um, so we get to show his reaction uh, to the modern world, modern standards of masculinity. I've always found him more evolved uh, because I wanted him to be. Uh, you know, if, if Michael was a kind of ideal gay man for me, so, 
Brian was the, the friend uh, that I wanted to have. And I did have a lot of them. I knew a lot, I still know, a lot of evolved straight guys. And they are a, a prize for women. The fact that they are not threatened by gay men makes them a prize because it means, I find, I think, that they have more respect for women in the process. Um, Brian is also hot. I mean, like, yes, he's hot. Let's face it. I think I think he is also hot. Thank you very much for your question. I have to say that we are out of time. Our visit to Twenty Eight Barbary Lane, our gathering of our logical family. Um, is over. I want you to join me in thanking City Books, the Theatre Royal, the Salon Team, Alison Barrow, all of you for being here, and our special guest, Armistead Morton. How much do you want to read those books all over again? The good news is, you can, anytime you like. You can find out more about Armistead Maupin and the other authors that we speak to at the Salon on www.theliteraryssalon.co.uk. Hold up. 